good morning uh, i welcome you all for uh, another session of uh, cryptography network security and cyber law today we'll continue our discussion on module 3 and over here in this uh, session we'll discuss about uh, authentication techniques we'll continue our discussion uh, which we had left in the previous session now let's first recall what we discussed in the previous session in the previous session we have uh, started our discussion on what we mean by authentication and we have seen the classification of authentication now authentication is the process in which uh, uh, out of two communicating par uh, parties uh, one of them will try to prove its genuinity to the other communicating party now this was possible with the uh, uh, help of a password or it was also possible with the help of a pass phrase now within this authentication we have again two types one is uh, the one way authentication technique wherein only one communicating party is authenticating itself uh, to the other communicating party and mutual authentication wherein both the communicating parties are uh, uh, authenticating each uh, themselves to each other Now we will uh, now for today we will continue our discussion on mutual authentication and within mutual authentication we will see the impact of using keys on authentication and we'll see it is rather better to have small session keys rather than using large keys that that are routinely used and also moving further we'll see the uh, use of timestamp in order to perform the mutual authentication in order to avoid a replay attack and we were up to now we have seen the use of nonsense for uh, uh, thwarting the replay attack but over here we will see the use of timestamps in order to thwart the replay attack now next we will continue our discussion uh, uh, of uh, diction, uh, uh, discussion on dictionary attacks now we will see the various types of dictionary attacks that are possible and uh, various ways to combat these dictionary attacks now this is the agenda of today's uh, session and at the end we will conclude this session uh, with the points discussed now what are the objectives of learning now in this session you will be able to see the impact of timing on mutual authentication that is the use of timestamps on mutual authentication and how they help us avoid the replay attack and also we will see the various uh, dictionary attacks possible and uh, also how to thwart these dictionary attacks now let's uh, continue our discussion on mutual authentication where uh, we need to discuss two more topics which were left out from the previous session now let's look at uh, authentication and its impact on key agreement now in the previous session we have already seen that authentication was performed using operations and uh, these operations involved long keys and these keys need to needed to be shared uh, a secret or it could be a private key but the fact was these keys were very very long and now what is a good practice that can be uh, actually adopted over here is now these long keys uh, which are or large keys which are part of uh, which could be a shared secret or a private key they can be used minimally in order to reduce the probability of a compromise on such important keys now how do we avoid this uh, sort of uh, compromise on these uh, long term keys now this can be avoided by having a session key and which is uh, which is very which is small as compared to that of the uh, long term keys now why do we go for this particular uh, short term keys or session keys rather than using the own uh, uh, sh uh, shared secret or the private key now the first reason being that uh, these private keys uh, generated are uh, they are generated using very very expensive operations and also 
Now, in order to perform integrity or encryption, we can uh, use small keys and uh, fasten the process. Now, let us take an example wherein we are using secret key cryptography in order to achieve authentication and also we are using uh, in another scenario we are using public key cryptography in order to achieve authentication. Now, let us look at what happens in the first case. Over here we are able to achieve both mutual authentication and we are also able to derive short term keys that is we are able to come uh, or agree upon some set of uh, short term keys or session keys or key agreement is possible here. Now, what is being done in the first message? A is sending a message to B saying that it wants to communicate with B. For this A is providing its identity A and along with that it is sending a challenge RA. RA is the nonce that is sending that A has selected and it is sending it to B. Now, upon receiving this B will encrypt RA, RA along with, uh, with the encryption key or the secret key that is shared between A and B. Also B will select a new nonce or a new challenge that is RB and encrypt it using the key that is shared by A and B. Now, the communicating party B also selects S, SB. Now, over here what is SB? S is the session key that is selected by B. Now, this session key along with the nonce together is encrypted using the secret key that is shared by the communicating parties A and B and then uh, it is sent to A. A upon receiving it will decrypt the uh, information and then what uh, that it has received retrieve the challenge RB and also it will generate its session key and send it to B. Now, this session SA session key SA that is sent by A to B will be again encrypted using the key that is shared between A and B. Now, upon receiving B will decrypt this particular uh, uh, message and uh, upon decryption it, it is able to retrieve the uh, session key A that is shared or sent by A. Now, both of them what they do is they will deduce the session key. Either they can deduce by XORing the value SA and SP at A and also B can deduce the session key by XORing the values SA and SB and use this newly calculated session key or newly computed session key in order to perform further communication. Now, let us see what happens if you are using a public key cryptography. Now, over here again A and B are trying to communicate with each other. Now, what does A do? A will send its uh, ID along with the ID of the recipient that is B. It will select a nonce RA and also because it is public key cryptography A will include its certificate. Upon receiving all of these, B will first verify the certificate and then after verifying the certificate, what does B do? It will select a nonce and also another uh, session value SB. Now, over here you can see how uh, B operates. It is selecting the information A that is A's ID along with the challenge that it has received from A and it has also included its challenge RB which is which will be sent to A and then we can see that there is a new value SB which is included over here and also it is encrypted using A's public key and entire information is signed with B's private key and along with this B is also sending its certificate to A. Upon receiving this information first what we will do? 
what will A do? A will first verify B's certificate and then decrypt this information using A's public key, retrieve SB. And, and after retrieving SB, it will generate a message and send it to B. Now what does uh, what does this mean? Now from the B certificate, A is able to retrieve the public key and encrypt this entire signed in, uh, uh, sorry and uh, uh, and retrieve the entire signed information and then perform a decryption. Now after performing decryption, it is getting the content of SB. Now A will choose session key SA and then encrypt it using B's public key and include the uh, challenge it received from B that is RB and also it says that this message is intended to B and this entire information is signed using the private key of A. Now since B has already received A's certificate in the first message, it can uh, take the public key present in that certificate to ver verify the information that it has received from A. Now let's look at these things, this further. Now over here, here SA and SB are contributions to the secret key by A and B. Now what, uh, what do we mean by SA and SB? They are session uh, uh, keys that are selected. These are random numbers. They are encrypted so that they cannot be eavesdropped. Out of these values, a session key can be deduced at both sender and the receiver. A simple way of uh, deducing a session key is XORing the contents uh, of SA and also SB, uh, session key A, session key B and getting the uh, uh, new session key. Now having understood why uh, we need the small term, uh, short term keys or the session keys rather than using long term keys itself because they are very expensive. Um, we have seen two ways in which we can uh, get these particular um, session keys along with uh, authenticating, uh, uh, along with performing mutual authentication. Now, we will move on trying to understand the impact of timestamps uh, during authentication. Now the first question that arises here is what is the use of use, uh, what is the purpose of using timestamps when we already have nonces? Nonces earlier were used to prevent replay attacks. Now how was this uh, replay attack thwarted with the help of nonces? Each party was generating a nonce which was used as a fresh challenge to the other party. It was like a one time password which was provided to the other party. Now the recipient is often expected to sign or encrypt using its own secret key known only to the recipient. Now what is the purpose of using this nonce? It is nothing but the freshness that could be proved to the other end. Nonces are never reused. Now, if they are reused, then the response to the challenge could be replayed. Now, there could be a possibility of replay attack. Now, an alternate to nonces is the use of timestamps. Now, what is uh, time uh, what is uh, time stamping? Now, time stamping a message with the current time says that this is the time at which this particular message was generated and sent to the other communicating party. Now, nonce was also able to uh, convey the freshness, whereas time, spent is, uh, time stamp is also able to convey the freshness. Now, time stamps are used with public key cryptography. Let us see how they are used. There are two communicating parties over here who are communicating with each other, A is trying to authenticate itself to B. Now over here, A is sending its identity and it is telling to whom it is, uh, this message is intended to, that is B. And T is the timestamp at which this particular message was created. 
and then F A refers to the session uh, value that A has selected. This is a random value selected. Along with that, this entire information is, uh, is signed by using the public key of B. And then also it is in turn again signed by using the uh, private key of A. And then along with in this information, A certificate is included and then sent to B. Upon receiving, what will B do? B will check the certificate of A and retrieve the public key of A. And also, it will first verify the information that it, is re it has received from A using its public key, sorry, its private key. Now, after performing all these operations, it will uh, um, generate a message and send that message to A. Now, what does this message contain? It contains the identity of A, that is this message is intended to A and it is coming from B and also the timestamp it has received, it is incremented by 1 by the receiving party B. And also it includes a random number SB. Now this random number is used to compute the session key. Now this entire information is signed using A's public key. Because A has its private key, it will be able to retrieve the information that is present here. And over this, another, uh, verif another signing is done, which is done by B's private key. And then along with this, B sends its own certificate, so that A is able to retrieve this particular information. Now over here, in the description, we can see that in message 1, A inserts a timestamp TA in her message and signs it. B on receiving the message checks if the timestamp is sufficiently recent and then verifies with the timestamp signature. Now B increments the received timestamp, in, inserts it into the response message to A and then signs the message. Now over here we have used a notation wherein we have a message which is uh, having X along with PU. This denotes that the message is encrypted using the public key of X. If the clocks maintained by A and B are synchronized, in that case the timestamp in the message 1 signed by A convinces B that the message is freshly created by A. Now there is another requirement if you are using timestamps and this requirement is that both the communicating parties need to be synchronized with their clocks. Now the timestamp impl implicitly serves as A's challenge to B. There is no need to in include the nonsense over here. By signing the incremented timestamp, B hopes to satisfy A that he is indeed responding to her message. Now having understood the impact of timestamp, how they can be used to replay uh, how, uh, uh, replace the nonces in order to avoid the replay attack. We can now move on with dictionary attacks and what are the types of dictionary attacks and how we can defeat these dictionary attacks. Now the word dictionary ref refers to lot of words and along with their meanings. Now what is the dictionary attack? Now this dictionary attack is induced for the passwords that we use. Now there are some passwords which have very less characters in it. And some passwords that we use usually have the names of celebrities or it could be the places names or kids names or your name along with some other uh, special character. Now some individuals you use permutations of characters in the names of their near relatives and friends so that they are easily memorizable. Now, based on such clues, an attacker can build a dictionary of strings which are potential passwords for a particular victim. Let's say I am a person and uh, uh, what does an attacker do in order to get to know my passwords? Now, attacker will get to know, uh, will try to uh, dig into my history 
and also my date of birth, he may uh, try to gain access to my date of birth, my first name, my last name, my parents name, my pet's name, my uh, near, near relatives name and using all of, uh, and my likes, my dislikes. Based on that, an attacker will create a dictionary of strings which could be my potential password. Now let's look at this table. Now we have uh, two columns in this table, password uh, and uh, along with that the reason for why we say this particular password is, B, is weak. Now over here we have password 1, 2, 3 or A, B, C, D. Usually whenever an admin creates an account for us, he will set the password to be uh, some string of numbers of st or string or of letters. Now these are very common default passwords that are used by everybody. Now, the, uh, now, such passwords are very weak in nature. Now, over here, Smith is the password. Uh, now, instead of having I, there is an exclamatory uh, symbol that is used. S M exclamatory T. Anything less than eight characters, we assume that the password is too small and too weak. Now, this is a set of password, uh, random letters, uh, which are um, which are shuffling of. Uh, uh, the name of uh, the celebrity Shah Rukh Khan which is spelt in backwards. Now if you see that uh, these uh, characters on reverse you get the name Shah Rukh Khan. Now again there is uh, a lot of weakness involved in such password because uh, an attacker will obviously have various uh, tools which will help him retrieve these uh, uh, jumbles. Now, now another uh, type of password with which usually people use is their birthdays, anniversary or days of uh, some significance. Now these passwords if an attacker knows you in person will be easily able to guess the passwords and uh, try to induce an attack. Now the next password is a permutation of letters in either mother's name or spouse's name. Over here we have taken Aisha and uh, like there is a little bit of jumbling that is performed. Now this uh, such a password is a very poor choice because the attacker will obviously have information about the person whom is trying to uh, gain access to. Now the last password that we are having a check on is uh, the password uh, with the name uh, Kolkata. Now Kolkata is a place name and usually uh, they are uh, already pass part of password dictionaries. Now there are two types of dictionary attacks that could be um, uh, induced or that could be um, uh, imposed. One is the online dictionary attack and the other one is the offline dictionary attack. Now let's see what happens in case of online dictionary attack. In case of an online dictionary attack, an attacker is trying to gain access into the victim's uh, account by providing a login name. Obviously, a login name can be easily uh, accessed and also one guest password. Guest passwords are used in order to log into a particular system. Let's say a vic there is a Gmail server and in order to access to this Gmail server, uh, what does the attacker do? He will take the uh, victim's uh, login name along with that he starts uh, guessing the password. Now there is some limit on the number of times this fellow can um, guess the password. Now in case of online attack there is a limit on the number of failed login attempts. Once uh, uh, these attempts are exceeded, what, what does the system do? The system will log that account. Now usually when you are performing an online attack, it is very difficult uh, to get, um, uh, get through the system with a, uh, with a password that is guessed. Now another possible dictionary attack is the offline attack. Now offline attack leaves very uh, less fingerprints. In case of online attack, the system is able to track the number of attempts and block the system. Now, in case of offline, one possibility is that the attacker can get hold of the password file and then uh, 
even if the passwords are transformed into something using uh, the hash function, but still what, what the ca attacker can do is he can gain access to this file and uh, maybe it is not that easy for him to deduce the password. Now another possibility is that the attacker can eavesdrop the communication link that is established between the victim and the server and then gain access to the hashed password itself and use the one in order to impose or gain access to the system. Now let us look at what is happening in this particular uh, code. Now over here the attacker is using a dictionary of passwords to implement an attack. Now let D be an array of uh, words containing the dictionary. Now over here let F be F of password and nonce where PW is the password of the cl uh, uh, client. And then let a small f be the number of permissible guesses and uh, how do we start with this? Initially we set that we ha uh, set found to false and also i is set to 0. We keep repeating the process until the password is found. Now x is calculated and then if this x is equal to the f wherein f denotes the function of password and the nonce if that is equal in that case we uh, the attacker is able to get the correct password that means he has found the correct password and the system returns the correct correct password. Now this uh, is a bit of uh, uh, code that is used to induce uh, a dictionary attack. Now the next uh, thing that we need to see is how to defeat a dictionary attack. One approach to defeat a dictionary attack is to increase the cost of performing such an attack. Now the cost is the time to successfully complete an attack. Now in any dictionary attack the most time consuming operation is the iteration in order to check uh, a, a, in order to retrieve a particular uh, password or find a particular password in the dictionary attack program. Now in this program this operation is most expensive. Now one way to make this particular operation more expensive is by uh, involving more, more uh, or multiple uh, hashings in it. Now when you in involve multiple hashings in order to achieve this particular uh, function f then this will decrease the chance of an attacker to be able to find the password. Now another approach that is used to uh, is uh, used to defeat the dictionary attack is called as encrypted key exchange protocol. Now this protocol uh, is responsible for eliminating the offline dictionary attacks. Now this combines uh, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol along with the mutual authentication which is based on the shared secret. Now the Diffie-Hellman key uh, protocol as we are aware is vulnerable to man in the middle attack. Now this is due to the fact that uh, unauthenticated exchange of information occurs between the communication uh, pa uh, communicating parties that is Alice and Bob. Now exchanges of the public keys that is G raised to A mod B and G raised to B mod B. Now to mitigate such an attack the encrypted key exchange protocol uses a different idea. Each side transmits it, its partial secret after encrypting it. Now this encryption is performed over the public key that is being transmitted from A to B or B to A. 
Now the encryption key PW is the hash of the password. Now let's look at this particular protocol diagram. Over here, let's say Alice and Bob are trying to communicate. Alice is sending her uh, uh, public key to B. So that B uses this public key to deduce the uh, shared secret. Now what is Alice doing with the public key? She is encrypting that particular public key using the password that is shared between A and B. Now what does B do? B will also uh, receive the information sent by Alice and send its uh, public key which is encrypted and also along with that it will send a new challenge uh, RA. Now upon receiving this information uh, Alice, uh, Alice will encrypt both the challenges one from RA that is Alice and one from B which is RB and then send it to Bob. Upon receiving this Bob will also be able to retrieve the challenge uh, RB and then send it back to Alice. Now after the first and the second messages that are communicated between Alice and Bob, both Alice and Bob are able to deduce the shared secret which will be, for, which will be used for further communication. Now let us see uh, how, how the attacker is able to uh, impose an attack in such situation. Assume that the attacker has an access to the public key which is encrypted of both the communicating parties. Now in this case the attacker try is to uh, tries to guess the victim's password that is PW. If the attacker let us say he has guessed it correctly, he obtains the true values of uh, both the communicating parties. He is able to uh, retrieve the public keys of both the communicating parties. But still he will not be able to obtain the session key. Now since the computational Diffie-Hellman problem is infeasible in large groups that are carefully chosen, the EKE is not susceptible to offline dictionary attack. Another property of this protocol is that it provides perfect forward secrecy. Now what is this perfect forward secrecy? A protocol is said to have perfect, perfect forward secrecy if it is not possible for an attacker to decrypt a session between A and B. Even if uh, she records the entire encrypted session and then later at some point of time obtains or steals all the relevant long term secrets 